Welcome to Goober Town Hobbies. My name is Brent, and today we're gonna be talking about how. <laughs> Welcome to Goober Town Hobbies. My name is Emil from Squidmore Miniatures. I've decided to take over this broadcast with my mad hacking skills. And Brent, I've got a challenge for you. Under your table, you're gonna find a letter with the rules of engagement. And good luck with the challenge. I can't wait to see what you'll make of it. What was that? Under my desk? A note. Emil from Squidmar Miniatures here, and I challenge you to a duel. I have found this artwork on the interwebs, and I want you to take a Primera Space Marine and to make a scene inspired by this story. A story about that lone ultramarine on a snow-covered hill, preparing for... you fill in the blank. I want you to analyze this very painting. Look at how the artist drew the mood, where the light hits, how the color changes from light to shadows. Look at how the miniature is angled and the pose it has. Use that as an inspiration to paint bravely and to try new stuff out. If you're feeling super brave, I'd love to see you try painting a backdrop. Best of luck, Squidmar. All right, well, let's give it a shot. Okay, it looks like we're gonna turn this painting into a little diorama. The setting in the painting is extremely vague, but I'm pretty sure I know what this is. Ultramarine, in the snow, with a hunk of monster flesh at his feet. I know the Battle of McCrag when I see it. Squidmar didn't play 40k when he was younger, but I was there at the Battle for McCrag. It's burned into my memory. Actually, that's a bit of a lie. I don't fully remember the lore, but I think it'll be fun to base this project on my partial memories of what happened when the Tyranids came to the Ultramar system and swarmed the fortress planet of McCrag. Don't worry, the bits that I remember are pretty metal. It's such a cool scene. A lone marine who has clearly been in the fight for a while, reloading his bolter and getting ready for more. The picture doesn't have a ton of details about his situation, but that's what her imagination is for. I decided to start by sourcing the base and the backdrop, or at least deciding on the form factor for this project. Somewhere between a large display base and a small diorama is what I have in mind. At my craft store, I found this wooden base or plaque or whatever it is for a dollar. Interestingly, the craft store was also having a sale on canvas. Do you see what I see in this picture? Buy one, get two free. Nice. Just look at that shopping cart. A true warrior will seize an opportunity. So I got a base and some stretched canvas for a backdrop. After I cleaned up the base with a bit of sandpaper, I started to paint the edges black. In one of Miniac's videos, Scott mentions that wooden plinths can really soak up a lot of paint, so I decided to start getting some layers of black paint on early. Next, I got to work by building a little terrain for the base. The marine needs a hill to stand on. Actually, I decided to try to build a crater. I want a blasted land. Evidence of battle and carnage everywhere, and a lone marine standing on the high ground, reloading his bolter and getting ready for the next wave. What I'm using here are a couple of bits from the old Imperial Sector Terrain Kit. Some hot glue, some aluminum foil, and some DOS clay. Now, my future history of what has happened 40,000 years from now is a bit rusty, but the version of the story that's locked in my brain is pretty epic. A giant Tyranid swarm comes to the ultramarine homeworlds and starts consuming everything. But when they get to the fortress planet of McCrag, it's a real unstoppable force versus a movable object type of situation. The ultramarines are peerless warriors with fearsome weaponry. The Tyranids are a never-ending swarm of monstrous bugs. The Tyranids plow through the galaxy, feeding, acquiring biomass, and leaving barren worlds in their wake. When the Tyranid Swarm engulfs McCrag, the Marines make their stand against the bugs like no prey ever has before. The Marines fight like giants, they fight like heroes. They're pushed ever backward, but last stands across the planet by precious time. 
precious time in the hopes that reinforcements might arrive from off-world. Some of the most famous last stands are made at polar fortresses, where ultramarines battle against monsters in the frozen wastes. Well, that's pretty much where my memory cuts out, and that's good enough for me. In my mind, this ultramarine is defending his homeworld against an invading swarm of bugs. There's carnage, and there's destruction everywhere, and he's fighting in the snow. He's been fighting for days straight. He's reloading that holy bolter for the thousandth time, and he's filling yet another crater with the corpses of his enemy. Well, the base is starting to come together now. I have room for the marine to stand on the lip of a crater. In the crater, we can see evidence of an underground bunker which has been destroyed. Maybe the explosion actually originated from the bunker. Maybe this marine destroyed his own bunker as it was being overrun. Everywhere is gore and shrapnel. And here that marine still stands, reloading his weapon. I can always add more detail and texture later, but I'm happy with where the base is for now. A lot of this will get covered by snow anyway, so I can hide anything that I end up not liking with a bit of snow texture. I primed the whole thing black with my airbrush, and then I used the airbrush to put on a bit of steel for the bunker ruins and the shrapnel. Then I put brown on most of the dirt. For all of the other details, I'll come back in with a brush in a little bit. So here's the actual marine. Built, primed black, and given a white zenithal spray. I'm glad that Emil suggested specifically using a new Primaris Marine figure. I remembered seeing that the Intercessor kit had bits for a Marine reloading his bolt rifle, and I thought that was pretty cool. I ended up deciding to work entirely with bits from that Intercessor kit to build our heroic Ultramarine. The biggest issue that I encountered is that the handedness for the Intercessor bits and the Marine in the picture is swapped. One is holding the weapon in his left hand, the other in the right. I considered doing an extensive conversion, or maybe painting the mirror image and swapping things around with movie magic, but nah. One marine is left-handed, the other is right-handed, and that's okay. Doesn't stop me from drawing inspiration from the picture and putting it onto the figure. So this zenithal highlight step wasn't strictly needed. By the time I get the blue base coat on, it will almost entirely disappear. But I think it's worth it just for this shot. That white ink sprayed on the model from above really helps to see the volumes of the figure and get to know it a little bit better. This shot serves as a good reference as I go forth and paint this model. Sam Lenz in particular advocates for this technique. These shots will be useful as I get to know the model and think about how to paint it. Then I covered that beautiful prime job with some ultramarine blue from Army Painter. Of course, by ultramarine blue, they're talking about the classic color pigment. The paint bottle says 100% match on it. Of course, by that, they're talking about 100% match to the Army Painter spray paint. Coincidentally, though, this is a great color to use to paint Space Marines from the Ultramarines chapter. I got a nice, smooth coat down, and then I got ready for some brush painting. I started sketching the yellow bits with a deep ochre color. Ochre pigments tend to have better coverage than pure yellow pigments, and so ochre is a great color to use to layer up to yellow. As it turned out though, the ochre looked pretty good all on its own. I kept going with the other accent colors. A nice thing about Space Marines is that they can be painted pretty quickly if the power armor is a single color. With the placement of the secondary colors, I'm doing my best to match the picture. There are a lot of grey tones in the picture, but no deep blacks, so that meant the bolter got to be grey. This grey also served as an undercoat for the parts that would eventually be metallic steel. And of course, dark grey for the armor joints. Brown for some belts and pouches. Then, the marine's knee pad got painted red. I kept the red on the right knee pad, just like the picture. Other than the weapon and the clip switching hands, I tried to keep the handedness of everything the same as it was in the picture. My marine only has three purity seals. Of course, in the picture, the marine has a forest of purity seals hanging from his belt, but I didn't have that many bits, and I like my take on the figure better anyway. I put down thin coats of base colors until I got to this point. We're looking pretty clean, and we've got most of the colors in the right places. 
There are no shadows or highlights on the model yet, but it's a solid base coat. Ordinarily, the next steps might be to add some washes, and then a bunch of edge highlighting. But Emil challenged me to try to reproduce the lighting from the picture, and honestly there isn't a lot of edge highlighting in that marine. Let's look closely and come up with a strategy. He's a big man casting a big shadow, and bits of his armor are definitely glinting in the light. Let's look at a few things in particular. He's lit from above and from his left side. I'll try to do the same on my figure. He's casting a ton of shadows on himself. His left leg is almost entirely shadowed, as is much of his chest and the inside of his arms and his legs. I think his right thigh is very instructive. There's a sharp line of shadow. That's not a smooth color transition, that's a harsh line. There's also a pretty sharp glint on the sunny portion of that right thigh. The position of the glint tracks down the leg. At a certain angle of curvature for that armor, the sun hits the armor just right and it sends the light right into your eye. Or that's the effect that the artist is going for. Another note, on the chest you can see that where the gold is glinty, the blue is also glinty. The change in the armor's color from blue to gold right there doesn't fundamentally change the way that the sun is reflecting off of this warrior. One final comment. This is an awesome picture, but the style is pretty rough hewn. Just look at that backdrop. It's super rough, but it conveys what it needs to. I'm using this observation as a final confidence booster. It's okay if my paint job comes out a bit rough, because honestly, that fits the style of the painting. With that being said, let's dive in. I'm going to apply some sharp shadows and some sharp glinty highlights to this model, and we'll see what happens. I'm not going to bother with fancy transitions, we're going for harsh and striking. No blends, no color progressions. I'm taking one dark blue and one light blue, and I'm going for it. I did decide to at least dilute these colors a bit with some glazing medium before trying to slap them down. I've got some Liquitex glaze medium here that I hadn't gotten around to trying yet, so let's see how it goes. Although I normally use a wet palette, something is osmosing in the wrong direction with this glazing medium, so it actually seems to work better to use a regular old plastic palette. I used about two or three parts glaze medium to one part paint for this. This is not a paint style that I ever really use, so we're definitely going to learn some things. I started with dark blue for the shadows. This is an 8 foot tall genetically modified and cybernetically enhanced warrior in full power armor. He casts some beefy shadows. I picked a direction for the sun to be coming from, above and from his left side, and then I used my best judgement on where to place that dark blue. Much of the legs and chest are heavily shadowed. Really, anything that wouldn't receive direct sunlight gets to be a darker shade of blue. Let me emphasize that I haven't done this before, we're in uncharted territory here. I looked at that picture, I extracted a couple rules about the ways lighting would work on this model, and I started putting down colors according to those rules. Either I'll learn something new and the model will look good, or I'll learn something new and the model won't look good. Once I had some shadows in place, I switched to the light blue for the glinting highlights. This color in particular really stands out from the ultramarine blue base coat, and the first few strokes really do not look encouraging. At times like these, I have to remind myself that this paint job is all an optical illusion. No one strike will sell the effect, it's only once a substantial portion of the model has been painted in this way that the optical illusion will really start to take hold and the model will start to look good. That's what I was telling myself at least. In general though, it's a pretty good rule. For a lot of mini painting, it's true that the first brush strokes don't look good. You have to keep going. You have to push through the ugly phases until the illusion starts to take hold and things start to look cool. Trust yourself, trust in the process, and just keep on going. Now, it's completely possible that this won't look great even when it's done, but there's only one way to find out. Keep powering through the ugly phase, and have a little faith that there's an awesome phase waiting for you on the other side. It's always darkest right before the dawn. One more note. The base coat is quite matte, 
and this glazing medium is quite glossy. I know this makes things look more concerning, but I'm trusting that I'll be able to fix it with a little bit of varnish. In addition to the blues, I also came in with a light yellow and a deep brown to modify that ochre yellow base coat. I'm following the same lighting rules here that I gave myself for the blues. My hope is that by following these lighting rules for the entire model, I should eventually get the effect that I'm going for. To check on how things are going, I like to look at the model from the angle that the sun is hitting him. That's above his left shoulder. Then I flip the model 180 degrees and look at him from the dark side. There should be some pretty big differences between the two. I should be able to see shadows on one side and glinty highlights on the other. You know, this model is standing on snow, so maybe his underside actually would be a little bit lit with reflected light, but uh, that's not what we're doing today. Baby steps. Once I had the lighting about as good as I was going to get it, I threw on a few additional details. He needed some oaths on those oath papers. I imagine that they mostly say, defend your home and kill the bugs, and no snacks after 10 p.m. Okay, things are shaping up. I was worried at first, but I think we pulled through and achieved a style somewhat similar to our source image. That difference in sheen is distracting though, so let's throw on a coat of gloss varnish to even things out. This varnish is going to lock in the work that I've already done, and it's also going to set us up for decals and washes. Decals first. I used the decal sheet that was in the intercessor box. I picked a few that I liked and that somewhat matched the art. I prepped the decals with a wet sponge, and then I used Microset and Microsoul, as is tradition. Actually, I messed up the big arrow twice, but the third time, off camera, I got it to play nicely. The others went on with no problem. After the decals were on, I brushed on a bit of gloss varnish. That seals them in and protects them, and also makes them look like the rest of the model. Next, it's time to wash the model. I had a couple of ideas in mind for this, but I decided to go with an oil wash. I took some oil paints and a bit of mineral spirits, and mixed up a very dark blue-black wash and a brown wash. I slapped these all over the model. The brown was for the parchment, the pouches, and the gold bits. The blue-black was for everything else. These oil washes slide nicely over the gloss varnish and do a good job of settling into the recesses. Even better, if you don't like the way that they settle, you can come back in afterwards with a clean brush, a bit of mineral spirits, and remove any splotches of color that you don't like. Well, I have mixed feelings about how the wash worked on this project. On the one hand, it looks awesome. Beyond just adding definition, the wash serves to weather the model and make him really look like he's been out fighting for days on end. The biggest disagreement between the artwork and the idea that I have in my head is that in my head the marine is more battered and dirty and chipped, whereas the marine in the artwork is a bit more pristine. So I like the grunge that this wash adds to the model. But it is also camouflaging a lot of the work that I did on the lighting. The lighting effect is still there if you look closely, but it's nowhere near as prominent as it was. I did come back in with a brush and some mineral spirits to wipe off some of the oil grunge from the parts that should be the brightest. The highest highlights on the helmet, and some of the gold on the shoulder pads. I do like the grungy look, but a pretty good argument could have been made for doing a pin wash on this model. What I mean by that is carefully painting a bit of wash into each armor joint instead of doing this messy all over wash. But what's done is done, let's keep going. I do want my marine to be somewhat weathered, so I got a bit of foam, dipped it in some steel metallic paint, and sponged on a bit of chipping, especially around his legs. Something we haven't talked about is those bone shards sticking out of his left shoulder pad. Those are ported over from the picture, and I assume that those got shot at this marine from a Tyranid bioweapon of some kind, and they're still lodged in his armor. If that's the case, he really should be pretty weathered. That shoulder pad especially should have damage. So I added a whole bunch of chipped paint. 
now I think the marine is looking pretty good. So let's switch back over to the decorative base. I got my brush and started slapping down paint. There's gonna be snow and blood and char and who knows what all else on here, so I don't need to be too precise. I gave the Tyranid chunks a bit of a pinky flesh tone and then threw on some red and blue contrast paint. I put a bit of null oil on the metal and I painted some rocks black. Then it was time to do some snow. I watched the excellent Miniac video on snow effects, and then I went to the craft store and found that Golden Light Molding Paste was on sale for 50% off. I trust Scott implicitly, so I started slapping on that paste as a snow effect without even testing it for myself first. I can definitely see how this stuff would make for some awesome icy snow. The only real problem is that it wants to form little peaks like frosting, and it took some work to figure out how to tamp those down but I definitely was able to get a pretty cool effect. I'm thinking that this base is the lip of a crater that was made recently. There was a lot of heat and all kinds of things were flying in a variety of directions. But in general, I'm thinking that the crater is scorched earth in the midst of a polar environment. Most of the snow is up here where the marine will stand. With all those Tyranid bits flung everywhere, we're gonna need some more blood. Pooling around the chunks, dripping down the hill, and just spattered everywhere. Tyranids were exploding, blood got flung around a bit. More blood. More. Okay, that's about enough. For now. Since this was an explosion, I got out some black pigment powder and started dabbing it around. This crater and the debris in the crater need to be blackened. The pigment started out very granular, but after working it around a bit with a clean, dry paintbrush, it started to make the type of scorched marks that I was hoping for. I really like this charred and blackened effect, and I think that it really sells that this is a crater made by an explosion, and not just an ordinary hill. Now that the first layer of snow is a bit set up, it was time to come in with another layer. This time I used snow flock mixed with matte medium. Another idea that I got from the Miniature Maniacs channel. Once again, I just started slapping that on without really testing it. The hope is that I can get a bit of diversity in the snow types. Presumably, one of the two snow effects will look a little bit more melty or a bit more icy than the other one, and that diversity will maybe help to give the impression that there was a big hot explosion here recently. Failing that though, at least we'll get to see what both of these type of snow effects look like. Okay. The base is in pretty good shape, but there's one last thing to do. The backdrop. At the craft store, I was able to find these little stretched canvases that fit nicely behind the display base. I bought three for the price of one. Well, actually, I bought six for the price of two. Plus, I bought them in a few other sizes. Anyway, it's time to attempt some 2D art. Something that gives me confidence is looking at the backdrop from the source image. It's crudely hewn, yet effective. I just need to give the impression that there's a world back there. Since I have a bunch of these canvases, I decided not to actually attach them to the base. I'll paint up a couple in different styles, try them out, and see what I end up liking. I have some acrylic paints and a cheap 1-inch brush, and I decided to just dive in. The general feel that I want is sky and mountains and snow and clouds in the background. I've got brown and gray and white and blue, so let's see what can be done. Both clouds and snowy hills are sort of gray and white blobs, so I don't really know if I can differentiate them. Maybe by position and context, if nothing else. It's also an interesting question about whether to use blue in the backdrop or just gray tones. Since the primary color of the marine is blue, I don't want them to get lost if the primary color of the backdrop is blue. but. Then again, blue is a great color for making an arctic landscape. The source image has a backdrop that's just gray tones and very simple, so I did want to try something like that as well. I've got some spare canvases here, so I can play around and see what's good. I actually did this painting pretty late at night, tired but relaxed, uninhibited. Slapping paint on the canvas and seeing what happens. I think you can see that I'm not skilled in this, but you can probably also see that happy accidents do happen. 
and some of the patterns that I'm making actually look pretty cool. I tried both vague patterns of color in the background, as well as actually kinda trying to paint a landscape with a handful of colors and a brush which was absolutely massive compared to the size of the canvas. Once I had three canvases covered in paint and ready to be tested as backdrops, it was time to assemble the components. This is what we've been waiting for. I stuck the mini on the base and then stood a background up behind it. The time has come for glamour shots. Let's see how this turned out. Not too shabby. I'd be proud to put this little scene on my shelf. In fact, I'm definitely going to put this on my shelf. I'm trying out each of the different backgrounds, and I'll tell you in a moment which one is my favorite. I'm happy to say that I was able to capture my general vision. A marine calmly and professionally fighting against overwhelming odds. In front of him is destruction and carnage. In front of him are the horrors of a war against a ferocious alien menace. The bugs know only hunger and destruction. Behind him, for now at least, is a barren but pristine landscape. This space tells a simple but powerful story. It really places this soldier on the front line. A hero holding back the nightmares. What I'm imagining is that he's fighting a rearguard action. A controlled retreat. He walks backward slowly, fighting all the while. And as the bugs rush him again and again, the land in front of him is continually churned into blasted craters, filled with the chunks of that primordial enemy. As a clinical assessment, I really like the base, and a couple of the backdrops are actually more promising than they have any business being. The marine himself is decent. I feel like I probably overdid it with the oil wash, because he does look pretty dark, and he doesn't have enough contrast. I think the bright white snow he's standing on compounds that problem. Even without the snow blindness though, I'd probably rate this marine a B. For some of you watching this, the marine might look pretty good, and for others, he won't look very good at all. This is all a matter of perspective. We're all at different places in our hobby journey, and we all have different tastes. I'm always trying to get better, and when I'm assessing my own work, I try to see the good and the not so good. I find that being proud of my work, but never content, is a healthy place to be. I want to always look at my work and be able to say that this is good, but I think I can do better next time. And I think I have ideas about how to do better next time. This was the first Space Marine that I've painted on this channel. It's a fine baseline, but I know that the next one is gonna be better. This challenge was awesome. It got me to try so many new things. Hot glue, DOS clay, snow effects, pigments, glazing medium, 2D landscapes. This was such a great learning experience. I even think that I got some passable lighting effects on the marine before I muddied it up with the wash. But that was a great learning experience too. Okay, I have decided that this is my favorite backdrop. This combo is going on the shelf. As a final note, I've flipped through a pile of old rule books and codexes, but I haven't seen this picture yet. I'm pretty sure that it's from the Battle of McCrag, but I couldn't find it anywhere. If anyone recognizes the source or the artist, let me know. I feel like I should reach out and congratulate the artist on a really inspiring piece of work. And of course, I'm thankful to Emil at Squid Bar Miniatures for sending me this picture and for crafting this really excellent challenge. Well there we go. What a fun little project. I am so glad that Emil from Squidmar Miniatures put me up to this. Um, if you're coming to this video from Squidmar Miniatures, well, welcome to the channel. I'm glad you're here. Uh, please say hi down below and make sure you're subscribed. If you haven't seen Squidmar's video yet, then I really encourage you to go check that out. He's a great painter, a great filmmaker, and I know what I challenged him to do, but I haven't seen what he came up with yet, so I'm really excited for these videos to post so that I can go check it out. Um, it's almost guaranteed to be awesome. Uh, so yeah, that about does it for this time. As always, thank you so much for watching.